Uh, I have, yes. uh, in fact, that's kind of another one of the goals, my goals for the next few years is that I want to do more things in the alternative world or other things. Uh, I do a lot of electronic based stuff, you know, of course, coming from Europe, I have a lot of influence in, in, in that. Um, but no, my, you know, barrier of entry is do I like the song? And especially even more nowadays where genres tend to uh, have less of, um, yeah, yeah, they all, I don't want to say they're all the same, but there's a lot less distinction between this and that. Right. And, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm open. Yeah. We're living in an age where everything is influencing everything. It's, Correct. it's crazy. It's, I don't know. It's like, it's for good and for bad, you know, like it's great because like you get to see what people are doing in like, I don't know, Zimbabwe, but you know, everyone has access to all the same stuff. So there's, a, I guess, a little less uniqueness right. to specific scenes or specific, uh, you know, whatever, artists and records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is, is, do you have any, any, any like, specific tri- tricks that you do in, in the mix that you think maybe people might want to hear about that maybe is less known? Mm, let me see. Special Irko practices, you know, <laughs> that, right. that, that your typical <laughs> mixer is maybe doing. Yeah. I don't know if they're very unique, but uh, maybe a couple of things come to mind that I don't see a lot of my colleagues do. And that is I do symmetrical stereo automations. Um, So I like to do a lot of these kind of things where we're going from left to right and right to left with different instruments over the time and the development of the song. Again, it's nothing, you know, life changing, but I, I don't think I've seen or noticed that. And, and this kind of, comes from back in the day when I would listen to records in headphones and I would, you know, hear the sounds moving left and right. And, um, you know, a lot of times uh, when stuff is static is uh, exactly that. It's a little static. So uh, since we can do that. So if, actually, if you go through my Instagram feed, you may see some screenshots of these things that I do. Where I'm, oh, uh, cool. I'll check it out. Um, yeah. So that's one. Uh, another one would be, I almost never use uh, the sends for reverbs. What? So, like, you know how you have? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Almost never. It, really? It's maybe ninety nine percent of the of the times I don't. So how do you, how do you set your reverbs? I duplicate the track, and now that the second one is my reverb or delay, whatever the case, right? Wow. Yeah, it's a lot quicker. It, it offers you a lot more flexibility with automations. Again, you can do a lot of shit because now it's an actual track and it's next to the to the one. And also, it gives you the ability of, um, I guess. Okay, let me let me rephrase this. The opportunity of doing a different blend that's going into an effect, which the sands offer, you lose that obviously, but you have a dedicated effect for the dedicated sound, right? So. You can use the same reverb, just multi multi down on different tracks, and you can do the level. So it, you really can achieve the same thing that way. Yes, you're using more CPU, obviously, right, yeah. because you now have double the track count. Um, but it's really cool, and it's a lot easier to do tricks on it. Um, so I've been doing that a, a lot. I think I started <clears throat> I started doing that when Pro Tools enabled the um, delay comp the real delay compensation, mm. and you could do parallel yeah, things. Yeah. That's when I started doing it. So, so that cool. was, you know, maybe like 10 years ago or something. Well, hopefully, so maybe that's something that's a little That unusual. is a little unusual. Um, and I feel like it'll get easier as like a, maybe in a few years when the new, or maybe in even a couple of years from now when the new Apple uh, chips, the the new M1s, M2s, because yes. apparently they're so much more uh, they're, uh, efficient. Yeah, they're powerful. Yeah, yeah and you yeah. can get, you can get, you could probably, it'll probably make your life a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Wait, what, what else were you going to say? I cut you off. Uh, no, yeah, that's uh, that's the two things that come to mind, I guess. For uh... oh, another thing that I use master tracks on Pro Tools to monitor sub mixes, sub buses, you know, those kind of things. That also I don't see that often. But again, it's not, you know, it's just I guess a nerdy thing that I do. Cool. I, I don't even know. I'm not even totally sure what you mean. When when you send four tracks to an aux. Oh yeah, yeah. Right now you have these four going into the aux. Yeah. Okay, now you put a plug-in, say a, a limiter or something, on that on that aux, you no longer see what's being fed into it, right? So if you're clipping, if you're doing anything, uh, okay. it, you you can't see it anymore because it's being hidden by the the dynamic. And this must be this must be like a unique to Pro Tools thing because I'm actually a Logic user. Ah, okay. 
Yeah. But, so what I do is yeah. I create a master that's before, or actually it's just looking at the input of the aux. And that allows me to oh, keep an eye on okay. any clip. I got you. Anything, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I would say a nice thing about Logic that, I mean, if I don't, it sounds like you're probably, most people, most people are stuck with their DAWs. <laughs> so, but, but a nice thing about Logic is that it actually, because it's those like 64, um, I'm sure Pro Tools will get this eventually, but it's a 64 bit summing. So the only, the only channel that can actually have clipping is the stereo bus in, inside of Logic. So you could see red on like an aux bus and, there's no worries because it's not actually clipping. Right, right. Yeah, it's the same on Pro Tools, yes. Oh, cool. Dope. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, what was I going to ask you? Oh, so tell me about uh, getting good rap vocals because that's something that's eluded me and I've already asked this actually recently on the podcast. Um, how do you get them up front and crispy without, you know, harshness? Uh, what's your push to DSing? Nice. Okay, so the following is Irko's recipe for getting good rap vocals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. New segment. Okay, so um, I want to make sure that I retain or fabricate as much intelligibility as I can with dynamics, right? So my intent, my first intent is to have those syllables, those words clearly understood by the listener. The way to uh, achieve that, there's a number of different ways, obviously, but the, the way I go about it is to use a lot of very fast compression slash limiting actually so 1176 is most definitely my friend in this um so i go 20 to 1 and it's it's compressing a lot wow that allows, that allows that delivery you know super punchy very big how, how many dbs of reduction are we talking oh I, i'm i'm going balls deep yeah like a lot i, I, I don't know if i can tell you <laughs> really? a number but yeah yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. You just, it's, just, it's just like... Oh, yeah. How many DBs? Slap down. These many DBs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the audience can't see us, like, waving our hands, like, like yeah. all, all the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, all the way. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know, 10, 15, yeah. 20, something like that. Like, of course, when limiting, those DBs may sound like it's an incredible amount of compression, but, you know, it's it's the loudest peaks, of course, you know. Uh, but yeah, we we definitely want to achieve a very chunky waveform kind of thing, right? Yeah. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we want to get rid of any um, low end that's not really useful information. So anything under maybe 100 uh, hertz or something like that. Don't really need it. It's not really bringing anything. So kill that. And, uh, and then we want to definitely push up somewhere in the you know, one, two, three, four uh, kilohertz kind of area. That depends on the vocal, of course. But that is where the 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 actual information that we were after for the yeah yeah that's lives. that's that's what I think of. Like I think of one k as like you know yeah. intelligibility intelligibility or legibility, but like but heard. Yep. Yeah. 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 For sure. So that's that's very important. Making sure that we have that portion, and then the high end. Uh, so the high end, we want to have. You know the the, the pristine, the high end. Uh, we're talking, you know, six k and up. You know, so like very very uh, upper part of the frequency range for the vocals. And inevitably, again, and the second you put up the uh, you know any shelving or any kind of EQ over there, you got to deal with the S's. Right, of course. And so that's another thing that we got to be very very mindful of controlling because we do want the high end. We want, we do want the air. Uh, but we we can have you know um, microwave uh, siblings <laughs> cooking the listener you know yeah. <laughs> so keep that in check for sure. So this is kind of like a broad uh, direction or roadmap to get good hip hop. Yeah, wow. So I didn't I didn't know that people were like compressing that hard, but I love it. Um, it it's, tell me a bit about uh, I guess what, what, do you have a favorite deesser or a favorite tool to yes. keep the s's in, ch- in check? Yes, I have a favorite deesser. And that is the RDSer from Waves. Wow. I've been using that thing for the longest. I remember, I think it was maybe 15 years ago or something, I audited all DSers that I could find from the real ones to the digital ones, everything. And that one was the best one. Then I did the same thing again um, when I fully switched to Pro Tools for mixing. And um, again, I did like another, you know, blind, quote unquote, blind test with all the DSers that I was uh, 
and that I had available at the studio where I did it. And again, that guy won. And I don't know if it's because I'm used to it and I, and I know it in and out. Um, but yeah, I use that all the time. And you will find that on every single vocal of my mix. Wow, that's crazy. I have to go see if I have that one because I have like, the, I know I have like our bass and our comp, but I'm not sure. And I think I have our, there our you do. Yeah. I have the gold, I have whatever the gold one is that I got from Waves. Yeah, back yeah. In the, so you definitely have I'll, I'll, it's in the box. I'm going to look into it. <laughs> Very cool. Very. It's an Israeli company, so I actually, I actually know people who work there. Love it. Let me see. What else did I want to ask you about? Um, do you have any other favorite creative tools that you use on like most mixes? Mm. So because the first 10 years of my career, I was working on analog uh, surfaces, you know, consoles and gear, of course. When I did the switch and started mixing digitally, I basically grabbed all the usual suspects that I knew very well in and out like the 1176 and, you know, the LA two A's, the tube techs and all that stuff. And I recreated my workflow around those units because I knew them so well. And um, so you will see all of those, uh, you know, from the 165A to, uh, you know, uh, any kind of tube-like uh, EQ. Uh, so I use all of those. And uh, and then I slowly uh, added all the the other tools that, were not based off of digital things or of, uh, of analog things. Like, for example, the um, fat filter products, you know, those are not really connected to any real units and they're fantastic. Yeah. You know, they're EQs uh, I use all the time um, for surgical kind of procedures. The, I don't think there's anything that yeah. I reach more often than those. And same thing with reverbs. Uh, you know, I've had the 480 for a long time. I used it all the time. So when I moved on to Pro Tools, I just audited a bunch of different uh, Lexicon 480 reverb simulators and found the best one that, that sounded the best. And I've been rocking with that since. Um, but yeah, and, and nowadays, because a lot of plugin manufacturers are sending me bundles or, or plugins uh, just for me to have and use, uh, of course, I have the you know overwhelming sensation of having a thousand plugins, and it's like, okay, with which one am I gonna fuck you? Yeah. Um, so right now, Steph, my recording engineer, I was telling you about, is kind of in charge of that. So anytime he bugs me about a specific tool more than a couple times, so much though, so much so that I remember the name of the tool, then I actually look into it and I start implementing it. I use it in my in my workflow. The thing is, you got to think about it like this, right? I'm mixing 20, 200 records every year. So I really don't have the time to be over there and fuck around and try different plugins. Oh, yeah, let me just try. Like, I don't have time for that. Like, if I'm in the studio, I'm working. Yeah. Uh, so I want to deliver the audio yeah. for my clients. And you have the have tools you know. You know your tools. Yes. So I, I got the why tools around. and I need that. So. There's something about not wanting to experiment with like new tools, especially when it's like it's on other people's dimes, you know, like you got you got to deliver something for them. Like, yeah. it's not that's not your time to, you know, oh, let me see. Let me see. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, truthfully, I do not really need another tube like EQ. I have already like five. I mostly use one. I don't need another one. Now, if there's, uh, you know, a new plugin that does something else that I don't have then by all means, or, or, or something that I'm not fully satisfied with what I got currently, then of course I will implement and in, include those new ones in it for sure. But, um, but to me, that's not, you know, I'm not one of those nerdy audio engineers that like to just nerd out on nerdy stuff just for the hell of it. You know, I'm not like that. Nah, I'm only half that. Yeah. The only half is music. Right, right, you know? right. <laughs> and that is the driving force around this, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Wait, so what's on your, do you have anything on your stereo bus? I have, yes, a MOG EQ that I use for very little things, mainly the airbender thing. So like the super high end frequencies, sometimes the subs also, but, uh, you know, everything I'm telling you about this master's treatment is very, very little. Like I, I really do little, little touch ups. So that will be the first one. And then the second one, I have a um, Massenberg uh, EQ that I, again, use very, very little for some things. And, and that's it. And then that's, there's a limiter and that's it. And those are the Just two. like the Pro L2 or whatever. Correct. So you're, not, you're actually not compressing the stereo bus, just limiting it. No, I never compress. Well, I shouldn't say never because sometimes it does happen for band-like things. Yeah, I will mm, do that. I see. But I rarely compress the master bus, yes. 
I, I will limit it to get a little more volume, yes, but again, minimum. Are you are you mastering your mixes or do you, are you 